I am so excited to introduce tonight's event because it is not a secret amongst my friends or coworkers how much I love and admire Diane Rehm. She's a native Washingtonian who began her radio career in 1973 as a volunteer for WAMU and has grown into the producer, host, and DC icon we all know today. She is the author of several books, including Finding My Voice, On My Own, Life with Maxie, and of course, the book you're all here for tonight, When My Time Comes, which addresses the urgent, hotly contested cause of the Right to Die movement. Through interviews with terminally ill patients and with physicians, spouses, relatives, and representatives of those who vigorously oppose the movement, Reem gives voice to a broad range of people who are personally linked to the realities of medical aid in dying. The book presents the fervent arguments, both for and against, that are propelling the current debates across the country about whether to adopt laws allowing those who are dying to put an end to their suffering. Moderating tonight's event is another friendly face of WAMU, Kojo Namdi. <laughs> host of the Kojo Namdi Show, as well as the Politics Hour. Namdi has chaired the board of the Public Access Corporation of Washington, D.C. since 1997, and has also served on the board of the Library of Congress American Folklife Center. Now, please help me welcome to the stage Diane Rehm and Kojo Namdi. Good evening. I'd like to acknowledge the presence here of Diane's husband, John Hagedorn. John, thank you so much for joining us. Also the presence of the manager of WAMU, J.J. Yore, and Several WAMU staff members are also here, sprinkled among you. They are the support system that Diane and I have come to rely on over the years. So we'd like to thank them for coming too. You, would you care to stand all of the WAMU employees here? Thank you. I have known Diane Rehm for about 30 years. I knew her before I started working at WAMU. I was hosting a talk show at Howard University Television, and then Diane and I were from time to time guests on each other's shows. And she was one of the people who strongly encouraged me. Well, not strongly encouraged, demanded <laughs> that I come to WAMU. And the person I knew before I came to WAMU, I considered a very genteel woman. When I came to WAMU in 1998, I found that Diane was indeed a genteel woman with one made of solid steel. Because in that year, 1998, Diane started struggling with something called spasmodic dysphonia, which caused her to lose her voice. You would think that anybody who made a living by talking, stricken with spasmodic dysphonia, would be ending their career, not this woman of steel. She fought it. She underwent for years very painful treatments that caused her to be off the air occasionally for short periods of time, but then she always came back. And she stayed coming back until her absences were less and less frequent and they were less and less long. She fought through them. And then her then-husband, John Rehm 
got Parkinson's disease. And in this book, When My Time Comes, Diane details the pain and suffering he undertook. And I assumed that the nature of that experience for her is what started her on this journey. It turned out that I was wrong. So Diane, start by telling us about your mother. Good evening. It's so wonderful to see you all and Kojo. Thank you so much for being here. You're absolutely right. My journey began when I was much younger. I was 19. Actually, I was 16 when the doctors told me that my mother was dying. Um, a 16-year-old doesn't quite grasp that reality, and so I did a lot of praying and a lot of looking to the stars and wondering, you know, what is death going to be? Well, for my mother, who was 49 when she died, and I was 19, it was a great deal of suffering. She begged to die. She begged to die in her hospital bed, being drained over and over and over again of fluid caused by, we're not sure what, whether it was liver cancer, cirrhosis of the liver, which the doctors all assured her it must have been because she was an alcoholic. And I can assure you, she had two drinks a year. At Christmas and on New Year's, a shot of whiskey with my father. As she lay in that bed, having been drained once again, a fluid that made her look as though she were 11 months pregnant. She begged to die, and I can remember rubbing her feet and crying and saying, Mama, I want to go before you do. I don't want you to die. And then on New Year's Eve, of that year, my then husband and I went to Georgetown Hospital at about 10 o'clock at night before we were supposed to go to a New Year's Eve party. I didn't want to go. I didn't feel as though I wanted to go, but I went first to the hospital. And when I saw the doctor, who was her doctor, I said to him, he said, have you seen your mother? And I said, well, we went in to see her, but she was sound asleep, and I did not want to wake her. And he said, I want you to go back in that room. I want you to let her know you are here. And I said, but doctor, she doesn't sleep well. I, I don't want to wake her. He said, go in and wake her. The rails were up on her bed, and I said, Mama, I'm here. And she sort of I think she was so out of it, she just kind of waved me away. I think the doctor knew she was going to die that night. And therefore, the next day, my husband and I, having just moved into a new apartment, had no telephone. 
his brother came knocking on the door saying, you must get to the hospital. We raced there. And I ran across the parking lot and got there 20 minutes too late. She was gone. Um, and I think, Kojo, that began my really strong feelings that people should not have to suffer. You say you have been a lifelong advocate of patient autonomy. How come? I think um, <laughs> when the doctor told me that my mother was dying, I had gone in to see him. My dad had taken me. I had an ear infection. And I could use some pretty choice words, but I won't. Believe me, she can. <laughs> he punched through the infection in my ear. And I screamed. And then after I had calmed down, I said to him, please tell me about my mother. He said, well, she'll be gone in 18 months. I mean, just like that. And for me, that sort of harsh way of speaking with a young person about life and death kind of turned me off uh, to the way doctors assumed godlike positions with their patients or the children. And I think for me it's been a lifelong struggle to, to make sure that I speak up around doctors and say what is and what is not. And I certainly did where John Rehm was concerned. I was about to ask, so did your activism on medical aid in dying kind of flow naturally from your feelings on patient autonomy? And did John's condition, John Rehm's condition, lead you to intensify it? Um, John Rehm, as Kojo has said, um, died of Parkinson's. In fact, he died starving himself and drinking no liquid for 10 days. I watched him do that for 10 days. He felt he had lost all dignity he could no longer feed himself or bathe himself or toilet himself and said to me one day, I am ready to die. And called in the doctor and our son and our daughter, a physician herself, was on the phone from Boston and he said, John said, I'm ready to die. Doctor, will you help me? And the doctor, we were at the time in a nursing home in Maryland, the doctor said, neither legally nor morally nor ethically can I help you die. The only thing you can do for yourself is to stop eating, drinking water, taking medication. You can go for a long time without food, but within a very short period, the lack of water destroys the organs. And I watched for that 10 days as my husband of 54 years declined and showed on his face, though never crying out, showed on his face the agony that that death caused for him. 
He died in 2014. In January of 2016, Joe Fab, a film producer, and his executive producer, Diane Naughton, came to me saying that they had plans to do a documentary film on the right to die. And Joe told me just the other day he was surprised at how readily I agreed to do it. Before we got to the elevator, as he was leaving, I said, I'm in. And that was three years ago, Kojo. For those three years, we have worked together on this documentary film, three minutes of which you have just seen. The book has just come out or comes out tomorrow. And that is the result of our effort. A question you asked many others in this book, I will now ask you. What is your idea of a good death? Kojo, it's a question uh, that our director, Joe Fab, really wanted to ask each and every one of the more than 40 people we interviewed around the country, be they patients or be they doctors or ethicists or priests or members of the clergy, what do you consider a good death? For myself, I would consider a good death as one that is peaceful, painless, quiet, perhaps having a party beforehand, <laughs> having lots of champagne, <laughs> having my husband, my children, my grandchildren, my dearest friends beside me, holding hands, telling them each what they mean to me, that would be a good death. And in order to make sure that you have autonomy in that process, in order to make sure that there is absolutely no mistake made about your desires, you recruited your grandson, Ben. Tell us what you told Ben to do. During the filming of the documentary, which, by the way, will be shown on public television a year from now, that is, in spring of 2021, Ben was using his cell phone, and I had asked my daughter, his mother, for permission to do this. I don't do anything without asking my daughter <laughs> for her permission. I said... If you've ever had the experience of Diane Reem asking <laughs> your permission well, to do anything, you'd understand that it's oh, not just an ask. It is, it's very important with grandchildren and with children to ask permission and Jenny granted it. I said, Ben, I'd like to speak with you now. Please take out your iPhone. As I was speaking with Ben about my own desires, Ben was being filmed by our director of photography, Dave Goulding, and I told Ben exactly what I wanted recorded for posterity, but most especially for my two children 
for my husband, John Hagedorn, for my grandchildren. I wanted everybody to be aware that if I had either, and this is very controversial, I know, if I began showing signs of Alzheimer's, if I had an incurable illness, if I was diminishing in ways that I could never again enjoy the fullness of life, I wanted to go, and I wanted them to know that I would want to go. And I read to Ben a paragraph that I had read, that Anne Morrow Lindbergh had read to her children. She had written it. She never actually read it. Her daughter found the paragraph after Anne Morrow Lindbergh died. And I quote that paragraph in the book because it was so meaningful to me, saying, if there is nothing that can be done, please end my life humanely. Please do not use extraordinary measures. And please follow my wishes. What I am hoping this book does, and our documentary does, is to get people to talk about the most taboo subject in the world, death and dying. We are so afraid to talk about it. We pretend it's not going to happen. I said, in a church service in Massachusetts, where about 300 people were there, I said, please, raise your hand if you plan not to die. <laughs> and there was exactly this same low-level chuckle, as though we all think it's kind of funny. But some people think, and especially young people, think they're going to live forever. John Ream and I, because of my family history, my father died 11 months after my mother did. Your mother died at 49 years old. And my father died 11 months later of a broken heart. John's mother and father each committed suicide. My mother-in-law at 92, my father-in-law at 72. So death was something that was part of our dialogue. And I believe that in this day and age, death should be something that we all talk about because the baby boomers are reaching that age where their parents are dying. We think about the idea that our children are afraid to talk with us about what we want. Why don't we raise what it is we want. And that's what I hope this book will do, this film will do, is to get people talking. Well, the book certainly did it to me. Because even though my wife and I had already had wills and had living wills, 
and those living wills indicated that we do not want to be resuscitated, after reading this book, I realized one has to do more than that. Much more. One has to be very, very specific about what one wants in that situation, and one has to have a conversation with one's family members about that, and in your case, you made Ben record that conversation so that it will last forever. But it's just an ongoing part of Diane programming me for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about some of the people you talked to who made that decision. Then we'll talk about some who are either skeptical or oppose it outright. Yes. Let's start, what was close to home for you? Mary Klein, who had metastatic ovarian cancer, and Stella Dawson Klein, they live close to your old neighborhood where you they, grew up. They do or did indeed. Mary Klein was so active and such in her partner's, her wife's eyes, such a strong, marvelous, talented person and carried on her life in such a fabulous way. When she discovered she had ovarian cancer, she did, in fact, go through numerous treatments, many radiation and chemotherapy treatments, until the doctor said, there is really nothing more we can do. And Mary, at that time, because there was no right to die legality here in D.C., she and her partner went to work with Mary Che to Ward bring... Three council member. To bring this idea to the fore. Now, Mary Che, as soon as she had gotten elected, wanted to bring this to the fore, but had been persuaded by other council members to hold off for a bit. But Mary became impatient, Mary Che, and Mary Klein became the perfect advocate to come forward to talk about her own illness and the fact that she did not want to suffer, that she had done everything she could to try to stay alive, but knew that eventually and shortly she was going to die and did not want to die suffering. She testified, she lobbied, she wrote letters, and finally, the District of Columbia City Council voted so that now D.C. has a medical aid in dying law. When we began this process, in 2016, just three years ago, there were three states at the time that had medical aid in dying. Now, because of people like Mary Klein, because of people like Brittany Menard in California, who had to move to Oregon to obtain medical aid in dying, now, there are nine states plus the District of Columbia which have medical aid in dying. I feel very fortunate that people like Mary Klein and Mary Che really made this an issue. I pray that Maryland, Virginia, New York, Connecticut, and other states will follow suit before long. So, 
Thank you. The District of Columbia got a medical aid in dying law on the books. Problem solved for Mary Klein, right? Wrong. Then you have to find a physician who's willing to do it. Tell them about Mary's odyssey in that regard. Mary Klein looked and looked and looked and finally found a physician who was willing to work with her. And this physician... Dr. Catelyn Roth. I have to confess to you, she is now my physician. I wonder why. Because she believes in medical aid in dying, I have now turned to her. But there are very few physicians. Initially, D.C. said, you have to have a registry, and you have to list your name as a physician willing to carry out medical aid in dying, and very few physicians were willing to put their name out there in public. But now we have a few, very few, and the medication is very, very difficult to get hold of. One second all was taken off the market by one of our drunk companies. Ask me why, and I cannot answer it. One second all was taken off the market. A number of pharmacies began to create their own potions. And now you have to really find it through a physician. It's not easy. I am hoping that that process will become easier as time goes on. After all, Oregon has had this law in place for 22 years. Uh, the number of people who have applied for medical aid in dying and received the medication, only two-thirds of those people have actually used it. One-third have had the medication and have chosen not to use it. There has not been a single case brought of any sort of coercion or pressure or illegal activity on anyone's part. Now let's talk about the folks who are against it. That's where I was just getting to. <laughs> because in the case of the DC legislation, your neighbor, someone who lives in the same building you lived in, Selma Lucky Roosevelt, she testified in favor and she was dismayed that all of the physicians who testified were against it. And you had a conversation with Mary Klein's physician, who is now your physician, Dr. Catalin Roth, and she told you about conversations she has had with her colleagues and how, I guess, torn they are about it. But why did all of these physicians who testified here oppose it? Well... Um, for a number of reasons. I think many go back to the idea that physicians should do no harm. Now, let us begin to wonder in whose head harm exists. Does it exist in the mind and heart of the patient who may be receiving one more treatment 
that does no good? Does it exist in the mind of the doctor who feels, well, let's try this one more thing? There is a wheel that patients can get onto, especially those who are suffering from serious cancer diagnoses, who try one treatment after another. The church, and most especially the Roman Catholic Church. Because you testified in Massachusetts in favor of this bill, and... In Maryland as well. In the case of Massachusetts, you also talked with a Catholic priest in Massachusetts. One of the longer conversations in the book, as a matter of fact. What rationale did that priest offer for the church's opposition? Well, and I must say, to a certain extent, I agree with the church's position that if you believe that God should be the only decider, I support you 100%. If you, as a patient, believe you should have every single treatment that medical science can offer you, and you want that, I support you 100%. In the same way, I believe that at some point, I want to make my own decision that enough is enough. I want to be supported. And many of those doctors continue to believe that the Hippocratic Oath says to them that they must do no harm, and they interpret that to mean I may not take part in ending an individual's life, but my role is to keep that patient alive. Younger physicians are now learning more and more about that do no harm and what that actually means. I'm going to start asking members of the audience to, if you have questions or comments, to approach the two microphones in the room, and we will shortly get to your questions and comments. I just have a few more questions for Diane, because Dan Diaz, the husband of Brittany Maynard, who had a brain tumor, he's a lifelong Catholic. He said he is comfortable with Brittany's decision to seek medical aid in dying. She was the one who had to go to Oregon, move from California to Oregon. And how about your own faith, Diane? How do you reconcile your strong support for medical aid in dying with your own faith? I am a strong believer in God and have been since I was a very young child. I have believed in miracles in my life. And actually, though I won't go into it, have believed I have seen some miracles so that my belief in God is strong. And I, my own belief is that God would not want to see me suffer unnecessarily from a prolonged illness. I mean, I, I reconcile that very easily. I receive Holy Communion, I kneel and pray, and I pray sort of in thanks 
for lots of things, for my life, for my children, for trees, for flowers. I mean, my God is there with me, and I know that. Two questions before we go to the audience. Tell us about the organization Compassion and Choices. Oh, it's a wonderful organization. Compassion and Choices is supporting us in this documentary film because we're there looking for the same final issue to support, and that is choice in dying, choice at the end, medical aid in dying for those who want it. Never for anyone who doesn't want it. No one approaches compassion and choices without wanting control at the end of one's life. And for me, the most intriguing thing of all, what are death cafes? Death cafes are happening around the country. I regard this as a huge death cafe. I was thinking that, yes. A huge death cafe. In fact, what happens at death cafes is that friends, neighbors, members of families come together, sit at tables of six or eight, and talk with each other about what they want at the end of life. In Indianapolis, I ran into a group that has gathered as a neighborhood because they want their neighbors to know, not just their family members, not just their doctors, but also their neighbors to know exactly what they want. Perhaps they don't want 911 to be called. I don't want 911 to be called if I have a stroke or a major heart attack. I do not want that because I know, as I write in the book about an 81-year-old woman who was taken to the hospital, who had all of her documents in order, saying, do not resuscitate, who found herself in the emergency room, resuscitated, and then in the ICU, woke up absolutely furious that she had not been allowed to die. I don't want that to happen. So I'm not going to call 911. And John Hagedorn, you better not call 911 <laughs> either. See, she just requested him, OK? <laughs> Uh, let the record show that you have all now participated in a death cafe. <laughs> you, sir. Uh, well, good evening. Thank you so much for your comments this evening. I'm Thank a you. critical care and transplant cardiologist. I actually direct a cardiac ICU in Northern Virginia, and I will share with you that to in, uh, engage in this conversation, I'll make this required reading for our 100 physicians and nurses that are under my care. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I have two questions, though, um, which come up often for physicians. Uh, one, broadly speaking, what is your view of palliative and hospice services, and how do they enter into this conversation? And number two, what advice do you give, which uh, I deal with on a daily basis, um, families who disagree with the patient about their decision? And let, me, uh, let me address the first question first, and that is palliative care and hospice care. I support both. However, I, and in the film, you will see physicians acknowledging that palliative care cannot reach every kind of pain. So for those doctors who say, 
we can always keep the pain from getting to you. I'm sorry, I just don't accept that from what I have heard from physicians. I know that you can put someone in enough of a shadowy state that he or she will die sleeping. I don't want that for myself. I want to be present. I want to be able to say goodbye. And I want to be able to do so without pain. Now, as for... Family members who family members, do not agree. That's why I'm saying to Kojo and to everyone out there, it is so necessary to have this conversation before you reach that last hospital bed. I mean, how many families have a loved one taken to the hospital and they say, oh my God, what do we do now? Do we pull the plug? Do we let her just stay there with a ventilator? Do, does it just go on and on? I don't know what you as a doctor, an individual doctor, might say. I did ask one doctor in the film who is in California, and I said, do you ever say to the patient, I'm sorry, we can't do anything more? And she said, never. She said, we can always use palliative care or hospice or whatever. That's not an honest answer. It's not an honest answer. And doctors, and I believe younger ones, are reaching this point where they are going to be more honest with their patients. That's what I would ask. Thank you for your questions. Your turn, sir. Um, thank you so much to both of you for this conversation. Um, my name is Nathan, and I'm a, and I'm a college student here in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, I very much look forward to reading the book. Um, in going through the book, I found it very interesting to read the different, the different interviews that you did for the book with people who hold different opinion, who hold somewhat different opinions on the topic. And my question is, what would you say were some of the most meaningful aspects of the interviews that you conducted? I think the ones that were the most moving and the most meaningful to me were two. One at the start of the book with a woman who had medical aid in dying, who had the BRCA gene, was dying of breast cancer. She had had treatment after treatment. Who said, I'd really love to live until I'm 90 but I know that's not going to be. I'm ready whenever it comes, but I don't want to leave my children, and at the same time, I don't want my children to see me suffer. I've seen my own aunt, my mother, suffer. I don't want them to see me suffer. The other most moving interview for me was with my own high school sweetheart who had prostate cancer that had spread to his entire skeletal system. He too 
lived in a state in Colorado where medical aid in dying is legal. He had the medication. In the end, he did not use it. He used humor as he thought about his own death. But he and his wife talked so honestly about what was going to happen. And in the end, he died before we finished our film. It was very meaningful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you so much for answering questions. Um, I'm not really familiar with all of the laws, so this might be a moot topic. But um, in terms of laws that require self-administration of the medicine that you can receive, I was just wondering what your, your thoughts are on the pros and cons and how you feel about it. The effect of the matter is that under the current law, every law in the nine states plus D.C., the individual who requests the medication who is dying must be able to self-medicate. No one, no one is supposed to be able to help with that. Now, Mary Che told us that some who are part of the disabled community argued against that because they might not be able to self-administer. Now, Oregon is trying to deal with that. And there are some other methods that are being talked about but have not been included yet in any law. But it's a safeguard and yet a preventive for those who may be so physically disabled. I mean, the ALS patient, for example. There are some who are experimenting with the idea, at least talking about the idea of administering the medication rectally. Tough situation. Thank, Thank you, you very for much. the question. Yes, ma'am. I just want to say I just love seeing you two live and hearing your voices oh, in thank person. You. Thank you. Um, but yeah, right. Thank you. Um, putting aside my work policy sort of hat in sort of the fee for service system that sort of supports this sort of keep curing or keep treating a system, I want to talk personally is that funny, not funny, my siblings and I sort of laugh whenever my dad is like, I want to give you an update on my end of life care and where I want to go. And we're just like, oh, yes, we know, dad, we know your plans. And it comes from his own experience seeing his mother die from Alzheimer's for 20 years. So there's that side, and then my mom doesn't. And then going to what we were just, you were just mentioning, ALS, I actually have a friend who is young and has ALS. And he, I've learned a lot from my conversations with him because I have benefited from conversations with my dad and his siblings of being open about death because of their experience with their mother and Alzheimer's. But young people, I haven't had many people to speak with about who have experienced death yet or leading to death. And, you know, David will just say he can't find the support that he needs, that when you try to find somebody to help you deal with death, it's to sort of, sort of find a solution to something that you are going to get cured or something, whereas with ALS or some of these other sort of death situations, the support doesn't really seem to be there to accept really heading face on that you are going to die. And I just wondered if you 
had thought about or heard that at all about people who are younger and not having that support or it being difficult and and Diane, can organizations like Compassion and Choices help people I like that? I think so. I think so. Had you or your friends approached the organization Compassion and Choices? We'll look into it. I'm going to see him in a couple of weeks. So I'm sorry. I'll see him in a couple of weeks, and I'll let him know about the organization. Well, he's he's done a lot of research, and it's just been hard to yeah. find a therapist or other. I think it's very hard. I think it's very difficult to find the right physician, but I would direct you to Compassion and Choices. I know that nobody here in D.C., and Mary Che said she felt it would be a step too far to go uh, to try to include Alzheimer's patients or ALS patients within the bill. A step too far. We must go one step at a time. So please urge your friend to contact Compassion and Choices and go from there. Thank you. And I was looking around in this region. There is a death cafe in Arlington. And I think that's the only one that's close in this region. In where? Oh, there's one in Alexandria too? Okay. Good. Great, great. Vienna. <laughs> Vienna. <laughs> Lots of places in Virginia. Good. I'm yes, glad. sir. Well, Diane, thank you so much for taking on getting people to think and then talk about it because you are 100% correct. None of us is getting off of this earth in this body. So the question of how do you address these issues is incredibly important. I'd like to suggest that although it seems complicated to deal with mental disability, cognitive decline, Alzheimer, dementia, I would argue, number one, the brain is the single most important organ in the human body. It is the only organ that distinguishes us from all other life on Earth. So when you lose your ability to recognize yourself, to think logically, you are dead. Your eyes may be open, your heart may be beating. So what we do right now is we take people in that condition and we put them in a warehouse to go through what you lived through. And I can't imagine how you watched your husband, even the 10 days. I, I just, it, the pain on the people that love the person is much worse than the pain on the person itself. I do understand exactly what you're saying. I do go back to that point of saying to you that this legislative piece is going to happen one step at a time. And we are just at the beginning. I think Joe Fab and Diane Naughton had this idea of creating this documentary at just the right time because all of us are beginning to think so hard about these things. The mental part will come. Thank you for the Thank question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm a social worker in D.C. I work with older adults, and I actually had the privilege uh, about a year ago to walk someone through the process of accessing the medical aid and dying law. So thank you for all of your hard work and advocacy. 
It was truly life-changing for this person and their family, uh, and for me, um, both professionally and personally. Um, one of the things that I did notice and that I have the family also brought to my attention many times was, um, although this is legal, the infrastructure doesn't necessarily exist for someone to access the law. Um, and there were a couple of, you know, happy coincidences that allowed this person to access the law. Um, but there were a lot of things left up to chance. And as a professional, that makes me uncomfortable. If someone comes to me and approaches me, help me do this, I can't be sure that we can be successful again. It is the drug companies who have put a clenched fist around this medication. And it has become very, very difficult to get it. As I said, second all went down to, you know, it, it used to be $25, $50, and then went up to two, three thousand dollars $3,000, and now it's no longer available at all. So now these compounding pharmacies have gotten into it, and it takes a lot of work to get that drug when you need it. You gotta find a doctor who will fight for you and get that drug. Thank you for Thank your you Thank you so work. much. We only have about five minutes left, so I'm gonna ask the remaining members of the audience to try to keep your questions or comments as brief as possible. Thank you, so first off, uh, you have a much larger, younger following than I think is represented in the crowd here. Maybe the youngest one in the crowd, I'm not certain, at 32. Um, so I've got a question from a religious standpoint, and don't worry, it's not weird and awkward and preachy, but some of you may think it's a little weirder it's than that. It probably means it's weird me and awkward and preachy. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, I'm, I'm a Satanist. I'm a member of the Satanic Temple. And uh, it may come as a bit of a surprise that I agree with absolutely everything that you're saying. Um, everything that you're talking about as far as the right to die. One of our tenets is, the third tenet is, one's body is inviolable, subject to one's own will alone. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what we believe is basically uh, you should be a good person and you should have control over your own body. Um, to not get into the much greater details that I'm Tell sure a lot of people have. Tell me your question. Yes, sorry, Please. sorry. Now, my question is, what is your take on uh, possibly leveraging religious liberty to emphasize the capability to have the right to die? To say it is my religious belief that I have the right to die the way that I want to. I don't know if Diane has that kind of religious authority. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure what you're asking me. I'm telling you that my personal belief is one. I'm an Episcopalian. I believe in God. I was baptized. I pray. My religious belief is consistent with my belief that I have a right to say when my life should end. Okay. Uh, I agree with that completely. Thank you That's for that. Um, That's it. I'm not. Thank you. Do have to move on to the next person. Sorry, we are running out of time very quickly. Hi, um, my name is Barbara Gay. I am with you. Uh, my personal belief, based on the experience of my parents, is we should have the right to decide for ourselves. However, I'm wondering what you would say to somebody who's concerned about the fact that most people working age are covered by managed care insurance, and a growing percentage of Medicare beneficiaries are covered by managed care. It's a lot cheaper for people to die than to be than to have palliative care and um, and to go on living. So, what what would you respond to somebody who would be concerned about financial incentives um, to encourage people to opt? for a quick death versus living on and needing more care. 
I think it's got to be up to each and every one of us to make that decision. All of our decisions, every day I make decisions based on what I can and cannot do, what I can afford to do, what I cannot afford to do. I think that those same decisions that we make as we live may be the same decisions we make as we reach the end of life. Um, I'm not arguing that poor people should go more quickly. I'm saying that I want each of us to decide for ourselves. And that decision may include, what do I want now? What can I do now? What's realistic for me now? I hope that those decisions do not come out of monetary concern. I'm sure some do. I think most come out of pain and suffering. Just two more. Please Thank make your you. question or comment brief. Hi, Roseanne Weissman. I had gone to a program at Iona. I highly recommend that to people who are looking for a place to discuss end of life. Yes, um, I agree. Two things. One of the interesting exercises they had was um, writing your own obituary. What did you want your obituary to say? Ah. That was really great. Of course, everybody laughed at mine, and they said, would you be happy if this is what it said? And I said, I would be ecstatic. So it was a funny one. But I learned there something that I didn't understand about the DC law. I really felt it was a right to die. It is not a right to die. You have to have two doctors certified. Absolutely. It is really hard. So let's say you're in a situation where you're ready to go. I mean, your mind is not as good, whatever, you're, you've lost your vision, and so on. You have no right to die under that. You have to have two doctors certify in writing orally 15 days apart that you are going to die within six months. Quite right. And there's only certain things you're going to die of with a, you know... A, no, that's not quite true. Okay, Re educate me, then. That's not quite true. It depends on what the illness is, and there are many that you could be suffering from. The determination must be from two doctors that whatever the disease is, the physical disease is, that you are within six months of death. And you must be able to say that without anyone else around. No relative, no daughter, no son, no uncle who's waiting for all your money. You must be by yourself. And that's a good safeguard. It makes sense so that no one can be taken advantage of. It is medical aid in dying, but you must meet certain criteria, and I understand those criteria. Thank you. Finally, I'm afraid, I'm afraid we cannot indulge in an exchange at this point because we're just about out of time and there's one person standing behind you. Hi there, uh, Nicholas Battle. My Hi. question was, how would you go explaining this to a family member that might be visibly um, afraid of their own mortality? Well, a number of people have asked me this, and <clears throat> what I would say to you as a young person is the way to start the conversation, and this may sound ridiculous, whether you're an older person speaking to a younger one or a younger one speaking to an older one, I would say, you know what? I've been thinking a lot 
about what I want at the end of life. And start talking about yourself and what it is you've been thinking of and what it is you want. And then perhaps that will little by little, and I'm not saying it's going to happen in one conversation. You may need to do it little by little by little to advance that conversation to really find out exactly what it is that person wants. I hope that helps. Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. From her first book, Finding My Voice, to this book, When My Time Comes, Diane Reem has allowed us to enter into her life and to use it as a public service. And for that, Diane Reem, we remain eternally grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.